week here at chapel. You saw the Easter uh, promo. This is Easter week, Holy Week, which is a huge week for the church. So everybody's looking at the cross and looking at the life of Jesus this week. And so we get to be a part of reflecting that to the world around us. Uh, you saw that it start, our Easter week starts Friday at Stations of the Cross down at Pickett on Court. If you've never experienced that, it's a great opportunity for just you and your family to take some time on Good Friday to make sure you focus on the life and death of Jesus instead of all the other stuff. There's plenty of Easter egg hunts to, to distract you, plenty of shopping to distract you. you got spring break to distract you. But it's important that you allow for your family to focus on what really makes Good Friday Good Friday. And so we do it in an incredible way, 12, noon to 8 p.m. It's come and go. You walk through. There's stations across that are artwork that help you reflect on the death of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, on the prophecies of Jesus, and you can take communion together as a family. And so that's Friday. The Sunday morning is Easter Sunday. And so help us help you by coming to the 8 a.m. If you don't have kids or if your kids are going to be in here with you, it helps free up space for other people. But it was a big, busy week. Everybody say, love your neighbor. It was love your neighbor week. And I was telling it up last night, and we had almost 400 hours of community volunteer service this week alone, which is crazy big. But it was, give yourselves a big round of applause for that. That's not including the Love Your Neighbor Day, where people were taking goodies or caring for their neighbors. Um, but it was sunny at Adopted Block, which was a, was a great time. Monday night, it was really cool watching. I think we had about 20 people who came and put together uh, dinner bas- bags, I guess, food bags for homeless people, individuals, and went out and prayed with people. There's people that encountered a, a Muslim student where they have an incredible conversation about Jesus from the Muslim perspective, but also from our perspective, kind of point them towards Jesus. Uh, conversations with people in a halfway house, giving them hope and, and all that, and conversations with homeless people. And then Tuesday night, the young adults did an incredible job on campus. They had over 50 students there worshiping on campus Tuesday night. Wednesday night, it was cool watching the, actually help, watching the kids help stock shelves at the Shoals Dream Center, watching them fill up the lobby and worship and then go and serve. It was powerful. Uh, and then Friday night, we canceled the car wash through the rain. And then yesterday was just a great day of serving our schools. And so it's a, a crazy busy week. Jana Davis, our intern from Radiant School of Ministry, did a great job putting all the pieces together. Give her a big round of applause. <laughs> Working her tail off. And so to celebrate, as you leave today, there are cupcakes in the lobby so you can grab some when you leave to celebrate Love Your Neighbor Week. If your Bible is turned to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. We close up our greatest commandment series today. A couple weeks ago we, we kind of pushed pause for just a second for one Sunday and taught on just the Holy Spirit. We're going to come back to this sermon today. And so back in the fall, twin, I had the, the privilege of going to London for the first time. So I'd never been to London. So we were there and and so, you know, I'm wanting to eat fish and chips, which I didn't realize that British food is the most bland food in all of the world. And so I ate, like, fish and chips every single day. But when we got there, one of the things I knew that, like, you research travel, like Uber versus everything else, and London has black cabs. And so they're going to throw a picture up. But a black cab is, like, just British people are more classy. Like, our cabs are, like, broken down yellow pintos with hubcaps on it. And these are, like, miniature limousines. And so we jumped in, and I didn't realize like how big of a deal these black cabs were, right? So like every black cab driver is pretty much like a historian of the city, like a tour guide of the city. And so we started building just conversations with all these different black cab drivers. And it reminded me of this book I'd read by Mark Batterson. He talked about black cab drivers that they have to learn over 25,000 miles of routes in London. They don't get to use a GPS. You literally tell them where you want to go, and they have to calculate in their mind how to get from point A to point B around traffic to get where you want to go. And it's such a a big deal across the world that psychologists actually wanted to study their brains. And so they have this test called the knowledge where they have to understand and know every single possible route in the city before they're allowed to drive a black cab. And so these psychologists began to study their brains. They realized that after the training and then after the test called the knowledge, that their brains were actually bigger than all the other drivers in the city. Their brains actually grew in stronger and bigger in mass than the bus drivers and the Uber drivers and the normal cab drivers. And it's this powerful expression of how powerful our minds and our brains are. You may not know this now, but you have a three-pound superhuman computer in your cranium right now. You say, Pastor, you don't know, I've been out of school a long time. Well, you got a three-pound Nintendo console in your brain right now. It's this this three-pound mass. 
that's able to do incredible things in incredible ways. It's literally a superhuman computer. They actually research it can actually do an energy-efficient computing. It can perform the equivalent of an exaflop. Let me say exaflop. That's some computer nerd language for meaning a billion, billion computer math problems in your brain in one second. A billion, a billion. It means right now your brain is processing a billion, billion things right now. You say, Pastor, I'm thinking about newborns. Yes, but you're also hearing me speak. <laughs> to put that in perspective, that the world's biggest computer, which is at the Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge Nuclear Facility, can also do an exaflop, but it takes 20 megawatts of power to do the same thing. Your brain only takes 23 watts, which is the equivalent to a light bulb. And so when you have that thought, it's actually a light bulb going off. It's a superhuman computer. It can generate 23 watts of power. It's also primarily made of fat. Your brain is the fattiest organ in your body. So when you start gaining a little bit of weight, tell your spouse, tell your kids, I'm not getting fatter, I'm getting smarter. <laughs> like just, I'm, I'm, I'm learning more, right? It, it, it's this brain, it's this matter, it's this organ that can do so many things. It continues on. It has over a billion microscopic cells called neurons. So many, it would take you over 3,000 years to count every single neuron. A piece of brain tissue the size of a grain of sand contains over 100,000 neurons and 1 billion synapses. And your brain storage capacity is considered virtually unlimited. It can process information and it travels within your brain at 268 miles per hour. Like your brain is this powerful, powerful creation of God that is untapped in what its potential possibly could be. And so the question would be, we've talked about loving God with all your heart, talked about loving God with all your soul, with all your strength, we've talked about loving your neighbors yourself, but with that three-pound superhuman computer inside your cranium, are you loving God with all of that? With all its potential, with all its imagination, with all its creativity, with all its power, are you loving God with all your mind? And I know in, in charismatic circles, Pentecostal circles, we're great at loving God with all our heart and our emotion. But for many people, we're not known for loving God with all our mind. And in Luke chapter 10, Jesus, again, the great commandment says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, but also your neighbor as yourself. The word mind there means deep thought imagination. It means the contents of your thinking. It means the way of your thinking, the thinking processes you use. And so Jesus is literally saying, are you loving me with all of your imagination? Listen, the older we get, the, the less imaginative we get. But God expects you to love you, love him with all of his imagination, with all your imagination. Are you loving God with your deep thoughts? Are you loving God with your way or your process of thinking? Are you loving God with the contents of your thinking? Are your thoughts saturated in the goodness of God or in the things of this world? Are you loving God with all of your mind? And so the question literally hitting today is that God is calling us not just to love him with our hearts, but to love him with our intellect, with our minds, with our doctrine, with our thinking, with our knowledge, with, with who we are inside of our brain. And the question would be to you today, before we even dig into it, are you loving God with your thought life? So many thoughts that are thrown at us from moment to moment. Every time you turn on your screen, every time you turn on the TV, every time you read a book, every time you start thinking about your finances or think about your life or think about your relationship, are you loving God with your intellect? Are you loving God with the deepest thoughts in your brain? Are you loving God with all of your imagination? When you imagine things in your mind, are you imagining the things of God or are you imagining things that are self-centered and selfish? Are you loving God with, with who you are in your thinking? Are you aligning your thoughts with God's thoughts? Are you aligning your mind with God's mind? Are you loving God with all of your mind? It's interesting. We, we don't normally think about our thoughts being a thing that we can love God with, but he actually is commanding us to love him with all of our thoughts. So today, I'm, it's a real simple day. It's spring break week, so I'm trying to give you a break in your thinking so that way you can use your thinking for other stuff. I'm just going to give you three quick ways that you can, you can love God with all your mind. 
First one is this. You need to renew your mind and transform your thinking by replacing your own thoughts with thoughts that are aligned with God's thoughts. You need to renew your mind. If you're going to love God with all your mind, you need to renew your mind by replacing your thoughts with God's thoughts. If I'm going to give him my mind, if I'm going to let him use my brain, that means I've got to take my self-centered, sinful desires out of my mind and replace them with God's desires or, or take my way of thinking out and put God's way of thinking in. I need to replace my way of thinking with his way of thinking. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. It's interesting that he's talking about when conforming to the world is about thinking and what the way you think. It's not necessarily the way you dress or, or what you, even what music you listen to, even though that's part of it. It's the way you think. Do you think like the world or do you think like God? Do you think God thoughts or do you think world thoughts? Do you think secular thoughts or do you think sacred thoughts? Do you think holy thoughts or do you think unholy thoughts? And he says you need to renew your mind. One person said, let the mind of the master be the master of your mind. Let the mind of the master be the master of your mind. Because the word right there for your mind actually means your way of thinking. So let the, the master of your mind change the way of your thinking that reflects more of the master's way of thinking. So the conform to the world means I let the world dictate my way of thinking. I think like the world thinks. I do what the world does. I sound like the world. I talk like the world. I think like the world. I'm consumed by the same thing the world is consumed by. But if I change that thinking, I let the master's ways determine my ways. An incredible book called Mozart's Brain and the Fighter Pilot, this whole psychology book. There's this principle where it calls it, when you learn more, you see more. When you learn more, you see more. It's, it's interesting because in the book, they're, they're really comparing these two different types of brains. And they're trying to figure out left brain, right brain. What they learned was it doesn't matter what side of the brain that you use the most. The more you learn, the more you see. Case in point, like my grandfather, he passed away, I think it was in sixth grade, but he was a, a community college science professor. And he, he taught astronomy. And I remember they had this little bitty field house that's now named after him. They had these little telescopes and I remember I used to love stars, but it's different when you look up at the stars with me. Like with my kids, I'm like, you know, that could be a star, that could be an airplane, that could be a satellite, that could be an alien. I don't know. Right, but when you were my grandfather, he would point out to you that that's this type of star. That's not just a light. That's this many billions of light years away, and what it's actually doing is this. It's in this stage of life. When you see that, that's not a star, that's actually a satellite. It's probably this satellite that scans across the sky. You see that right there? That's the International Space Station. And what you realize is the more you learn about the stars, the more appreciative of you are of the stars. Same thing with doctors. When you, you were around a doctor, when they talk about the human body, it's not like the, when I talk about my body. Like, I know it hurts right here. And they're like, they see the details of how God created the body and knit all the parts together to create this miracle masterpiece of life. When you're around a geologist who studies rocks, when we see rocks, we see gravel. When they see rocks, they see the history of the universe and minerals and gems and stones. They see the beauty of it. When you're around musicians, it's funny, around the office, when I listen to a song that I really like, and I play it for the worship team people, it's not always the same scenario. They appreciate the harmonies. They appreciate the, the arrangements. They appreciate the chord progression. They appreciate some, they hear more because they know more. And so the question is, when you know more about the world than you do about Jesus and his word, you will see the world and appreciate the world more than you appreciate the things of God. And it's sad to me that as believers, we have God's thoughts at our fingertips. And the more you learn, the more you see God in everything. The more you know his way of thinking, the more you see that your situation is never impossible, nor is it the end. The more that you see that he's the creator of all things, he's the author and the finisher of your faith, the more you know and the more you learn, the more you see him intertwined in your entire life. And as Christians, we should be so well renewed in our mind that we know so much about him that we see him in every single detail. In the sunrise, I see him. In the storms, I see them. 
In the waves, I see them. In the tribulations, I see them. On the mountaintop, I see them. In the nighttime, I see them. At dawn, I see them. When the moon is full, I see them. In every situation, why? The more you learn about God, the more you see them. And so it's powerful to know that when you're renewing your mind, you're not just reading the Bible. You're not just learning doctrine. One, you're spending time with the author of the word. And your heart's growing closer to his heart. But two, I'm literally taking my way of thinking out and putting his way of thinking in. And the more I can think his ways, the more I can live out his ways. And the more I live out his ways, the more glory he receives for the life I live. But so many of us are trapped in our old pattern of thinking that we can't, we can't get out of it. We feel trapped in our way of thinking. And the problem is, it with, really, your brain is a superhuman computer. And just like any computer, it has, has a programmer. Somebody's programmed your mind, whether it's your mom, your dad, the world, TikTok, CBS, Fox News, ESPN, MSNBC, CNN. Somebody's programmed it. And so then there's a program or a language that it has. And then the output, what it produces. And so you as a, as a human computer, there has been somebody who's programmed your mind, the program of your mind. And the way it started in the Garden of Eden is God created you to be the superhuman computer with all these capacities that literally Adam named every single animal on planet Earth. Why? His mind was as unpolluted, no viruses, no, no cyber attack, perfect superhuman computer. But as soon as Adam and Eve fell in the garden, Satan corrupted the files of their brains to now be programmed to want the things of the world instead of the things of God. It is like he put in a cheater coat to now change their way of thinking so now it produces something totally different that God wanted to produce. God wanted to produce life, now it produces death. God wanted to produce unity, now it produces Division. God wanted to produce this, this community, this communion, this intimacy with him. Now they're hiding away from him. Why? This program was changed. The language was changed. And so like any computer, if your computer is malfunctioning, if you have a PC, you know more about this than us Mac users, you know that there's going to be at some point malware or some virus on your computer. And when it happens, it happened to me before I switched to Mac. I have not done this since I got a Mac. Before then, I would have to reformat my hard drive. You know what that means? It means you literally have to take it and delete every single file off of that computer. Every file, including the operating system. Then they reinstall an unpolluted new operating system so they can produce what the computer is supposed to reproduce. The problem with us as believers is, many of us, when we get saved, your job is not just to get saved, it's to give your mind and your thought life to God. But what happens is, believers, we think, well, my, 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 my sin is forgiven. Yes, but now you've got to change the way you think, because that sin polluted your brain, and now your brain is programmed to still want to go back to the old things you went to. It's still polluted with the things of this world. That's why Paul is telling the Romans who are in a culture much like ours, you can't be conformed to the world. You have to renew or reformat your thinking to change the way you think or it's going to produce the same results that you had beforehand. Because as a man thinketh, so is he. So the problem would be, is the files of your brain corrupted? If so, it's time to reformat the hard drive. And there's two operating systems. There's an operating system of the world, operating system of the kingdom. If you'll throw that up there. Like, you can see, like, the operating system is, is what dictates where everything goes. It operates how you see the world. It, it determines how you live your life. And so what the enemy wants is wants you to live by his way or pattern of thinking called his operating system. And God is trying to give you a new pattern of thinking or a new operating system to live by. And so the kingdom operating system is Jesus-centered. He's the programmer. He literally wants to reprogram your thinking. It's called discipleship. It's called renewing your mind. But Satan operates the operating system of the world. Everything leads towards him being glorified. You say, well, well, well how's that work? Satan, if you look at the, the, this way sidebar, the church of Satan is not some religion that puts Satan on this pedestal and they worship Satan. 
they literally worship themselves. They worship the human. They worship the human body. They worship sexuality. And so the operating system of the world is Satan or self. The kingdom of, the, of God is invisible. Like It's functioning behind the scenes. You may not see the program, but it's functioning, and it's determining what's happening from behind the scenes. But the world operating system is visible. That's why so many people use it, because they'd rather use an operating system they can see rather than the one that actually works. Love. But the world operating system is fear. People ask me, Pastor, what do you think about this news thing or you know, this conspiracy theory or this doctrine? And I'll tell them, if it's based in fear, it's never of God. But if the motivation is love, then it may be. Freedom. Do you realize God gives us so much free? Even the Garden of Eden, the first commandment to Adam and Eve was freedom. You are free to eat of anything in the garden except this one tree. Freedom. But the world operates through control. The kingdom operates through abundance. Abundance, like the whole world is God's, but the world operates through scarcity, meaning you're so afraid that somebody else may take something from you that we're all dividing and conquering of each other. Submission versus domination. Peace versus anxiety. Dying to self versus living for self. Joy versus happiness. Generosity versus accumulation. Humility versus pride. Faith versus sight. Covenants versus transactions. Like one of these worldviews, one of these operating systems are going to determine how you see life. And what I think this Romans 12 scripture is saying is that we have to replace these things with these things. And when I start seeing the world through God's thinking patterns, through the lens of his word, it changes how I live a life. Number two is this. You must cultivate holy curiosity. Everybody say curiosity. By allowing God to stretch and expand your thinking. I love this one. Cultivating holy curiosity. So not just renewing my mind, but but creating this holy curiosity about God and the things of God, his creation. In Isaiah 55, 8, 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are your thoughts. Now, Now, straight transparency. When I was having doubts and, and concerns, like uh, in atheism, people would use a scripture against me to try to be soul winning. Oh, you can't ask those questions. Like, you, you know, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. You just can't know. And so I saw this scripture as one that limits people in their thinking. I saw it as one as a as a as a bondage for anybody who has questions where you can't ask those questions because your brain's not made to understand those questions. That's, I literally have people tell me that. Like your brain just can't comprehend you. You just, you just can't ask those questions because his ways are high. No, no. Now I realize that's not what this scripture means. This scripture is not a lid on human thinking. This scripture is not even a lid on human reasoning. It's not even a, a lid on human knowledge. This is the launch pad of curiosity for the things of God. We're saying his ways are so much higher than our ways that it should motivate you and drive you to learn as much as you can about these unlimited ways of God. His thinking is so much deeper than our thinking. That shouldn't get me to say, well, I can't know him and you know, I can't understand him. It should drive me to the heart of God to know him even deeper than it richer. Rather than this surface level Christianity that is literally dying before our eyes. This verse opens us up to all of the universe was created by our Savior, our Lord, and our King. And he invites us in to this life of discovery and curiosity of him, of his kingdom, of his creation, to discover whatever we can about him. Interesting. People call Jesus the truth, and the truth walked around planet Earth Asking people questions he already knew the answer to. It's like, does that not shock you? He's the truth. He, he's the, he created everything, but he literally spent most of his time asking people questions. And then depending on what church you grew up in, people say, well, you can't ask questions in church. You're not supposed to ask those type of questions. Jesus was a question asker. And so you'd ask yourself, why would he ask so many questions? Because Jesus knew that the answer wasn't as important as the journey of arriving to the answer. 
he knew that giving you the answer may have sufficed your, your mental need, but wouldn't help your soul be a soul of discovery. And he was wanting people that would follow him and journey with him and adventure with him and have holy curiosity with him and discover the deep things of God with him. See, it's, it's interesting. I have, a, I have a community group, a men's mentor group, and we're, we're going through, we just went through two books. And some of the guys are like, man, I've been around church my whole life and like I've heard these terms for God's names, but I never really thought about them. I didn't really think about their meaning. I've heard them a thousand times, but now I'm reading this book in the names of God. It's changing my prayer life. And see, the difference is between giving somebody the answer, if I could preach to you and say, God's names are Jehovah Jireh, he is your provider, God's name is Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, I could go through all the names of God and preach it really good. But it's not going to be real to you because I gave you the answer. I didn't give you the right question. But when I give you the right question and you discover the names of God yourself, they become revelation instead of just information. And when you really know the names of God, those weren't titles given to him from himself. They were people that wrestled with God and journeyed with God and discovered through revelation he was those titles. And so for you, you need to know it's okay to ask questions. God actually wants you to ask questions. Even the Bible, so many times we read the Bible, we take it at just a surface value. And there's an old a rabbi tradition that they would say every single letter of Scripture has 70 different faces and 7,000 meanings. Every dot, every letter, everything. And they use this beautiful example. It's like a diamond that, that every time you read the Bible, again, you see a different face of that scripture. And so if you read the Bible every year, for 70 years, you'll see 70 different faces of scripture. There's a Greek philosopher named Heraclitus, which had to be from Alabama. Heraclitus. And he said, you never step in the same river twice. You realize, I've read the Bible, I don't know how many times now, over and over and over again. And every time I read it, I see something new. And it makes me want to read it that much more. It, it amazes me people say, well, I, just, I don't like enjoy reading the Bible. Actually, this week, I was telling Toy, there was a, a friend of mine, I was in the Air Force with. I was not saved in the Air Force. He was not saved in the Air Force. He's, he's now uh, coaching basketball in, in Baltimore, Maryland. And, and he stood up my stories in my DMs. He said, hey, can you got seven minutes for a call? I said, sure. I was going to um, Clinton Debs having a um, – Devin Wyman, his school motivational speaker at Muscle Shoals, going to support him. I had about ten minutes. So I called this guy, and we're catching up just real quick. He said, man, he's like, man, he's like, you know, I, I always believe in God, but man, he's like, something's different. He said, I've lived my life rough, like, and da, da, da. He said, and this year, my sisters, because my mom passed away, he's like, my sisters, he said, let's do a Bible devotional together. He said, I've read devotionals, like, you know, everybody's read a little short daily devotional. He said, my sisters wanted to do a, a daily audio Bible. He said, and he calls me BG. He said, BG, he said, this dude's voice was, is the most obnoxious voice I've ever heard in my life. He said, the first week, he's like, I'm not doing this. But he said, the second week, though, something changed. And he said, it's turned into like this movie to me. He's like, well, I wanted to go ahead from Tuesday and go ahead and do Wednesdays because it was like a movie. I want to know what's going to happen next in the book of Numbers. I said, the book of Numbers? <laughs> he said, I don't know. He's like, like, this sacrifice and this sacrifice. He's like, and I'm trying to figure out what's going to happen next with this Levite and this guy. He's like, and it turned into this movie to me. He's like, and then I started realizing that all these sacrifices that are being made, he's like, I can't do that. He said, man, I've lived a sinful life. He's like, I've done everything and anything. We started sharing stories of, of our past life. He said, I couldn't. He said, there's no way I could get all those sacrifices to make that sacrifice. He said, then I realized because of who I am, he's like, if I, if I didn't have the money and I stole from somebody, but it takes a goat to pay for my sin for stealing, and I don't have a goat, I'm going to go steal somebody else's goat and make atonement for my sin. And he said, he started weeping on the phone. And this is not a guy that weeps. I said, you know the difference? For your entire life, you've had your mama telling you scripture. Or you read a devotional and you're reading somebody else's revelation of scripture. But now some obnoxious voice is reading the scripture to you. And you're encountering the mercy and grace of God for the first time in your life. And it sparked a holy curiosity in you for more. 
Curiosity is just more. Like, I want more. I want to know him more. I want to know his word more. I want to know his presence more. It's the holy curiosity. And when it happens, it, it transforms your life and cultivates or expands your mind. Another person, you never, or a mind stretched by a new idea, never returns to its original shape. And for me, like my kids know, and staff know, like one of my favorite historical figures is George Washington Carver. Like, I love George Washington Carver. I adore, I read everything I can read on George Washington Carver. One of those powerful, powerful stories of the gospel, redemption, knowledge, racism, unity, Jesus, you can think of. His mom, is right before the Civil War, there was no, they were, his family was trying to adopt. They couldn't adopt, so they bought a slave girl who got pregnant by another slave. They had George Washington Carver. He was a young child, a really young infant baby. Marauders would come through Missouri and steal slaves so they could resell them because it was quick money. Well, they stole his mom. They stole him. This white family who had basically adopted his mom and adopted him spent tons of money looking for him and looking. His mom had been killed. They find George Washington Carver with no life in him. Drop him down do CPR basically in the 1800s. Life comes back into him, but he's always a short, small runt. And on their little bitty farm at six years old, he'd be playing in their garden, and every single thing he touched in the garden would grow twice as much as the things he didn't touch. So much so that when the other people saw their stuff growing, the other farmers would ask him to come and play with their plants and flowers and crops and everything else. At 10 years old, he graduated the school. They only had elementary school for black kids up until, I think, fourth grade. So his family took him to the city and dropped him off as a 10-year-old. And he was living in a barn close to the schoolhouse. And a little old lady found him. And she said, I'm going to take you in. He became his aunt. And said, here's all I ask you to do. You're going to learn something, but I want you to learn all that you can learn and come back and give it to your people. He learns, he goes to high school, finishes high school early, applies for college, he gets into college, he shows up, they didn't know he was African American, it was an all white college, and so they tried to kick him out, but a rich booster got him in the basement, so he's living in the basement of the college, learning all that he can in painting and agriculture. Long story short, he learned everything he could. One of the most famous men in the world, and came back to the South, to Tuskegee University, to give back all his knowledge to his people. And he literally single-handedly save the agriculture and farming industry in the South. So how did he do it? Holy curiosity. This deep spiritual man, he said this. He said, the Lord always provides me with life-changing ideas. Not that I'm special. The Lord provides everyone with life-changing ideas. These ideas are quite literally a treasure from the Almighty. But it is up to each of us, however, to choose and dig for the treasure. He said on the peanut where there's 300 different inventions for the peanut. They said, how did you discover all these things about the peanuts? He said this. He said, I was in the woods. He, every morning he'd go to the woods and pray at 4 a.m. He says, in the woods, and God told me, separate the peanut into water, fats, oils, gums, resins, sugars, starches, and amino acids. Then recombine these under my three laws of compatibility, temperature, and pressure. Then the Lord said, then you will know why I made the peanut. And by doing so, he saved the entire South from extreme poverty. And he would travel from town to town with this makeshift wagon that was a science lab on wheels because people couldn't come to Tuskegee. And he would go from town to town and teach them how to rotate crops and share crop and, and all these details of crops, things he learned from God. And every time he would do it, at the end, he would do a gospel presentation and say, you know, God made this peanut, but he also made you. And he would describe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And from town to town, he'd have young men that would get saved, and he would call them his sons. And he'd write them letters that were discipleship letters. And one particular one, an incredible book, a little bitty book, he, he describes, this guy's describing how he became a minister. And his minister was at one of these meetings, and George Washington Cover shares the gospel, and these guys start standing up, responding to the gospel, he starts pointing out, he said, you're about to be one of my sons. And the guy says, I will never let a blank African-American be my father. Goes home, has a vision in the nighttime 
of George Washington Carver being his father. It messes him up so bad, two days later he traveled to the other town George Washington Carver was at and said, I will be your son. That man destroyed his racism, became a pastor, and now this man was an author and, and incredible pastor, I won't say his name, but incredible pastor, all because George Washington Carver had this holy curiosity. And so the question for you would be, what inside of you sparks holy curiosity? For George Washington Carver, it was what God created. For you, maybe music. For somebody else, maybe theology or doctrine. Maybe if you're a nurse or a doctor, maybe it's the human body. Maybe for you, it's, it's teaching or education. Maybe for you, it's being a mom or a dad. Whatever it may be, God put that question in you for a reason. And so why would you not spend the rest of your entire life giving your holy curiosity to finding and searching for the answers? You say, well, Pastor, what if I don't find the answers because God's ways are higher than our ways? You may not find the answer, but you're going to learn a whole lot about the answer. Holy curiosity number three. Shift your perspective by changing your mindset to focus on heavenly matters rather than earthly matters. Just shift your perspective. Change your mindset from focusing on all the earthly stuff to the heavenly stuff. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth or below. You know, interesting about the scripture, it's really saying, you know, there's a different perspective. And I think when you get saved, your perspective should change from an earthly, temporary perspective to a heavenly, eternal perspective. But in church world, we become so seeker-oriented and seeker trying to fit in with culture. I've heard people in church, when I first got saved, I was telling somebody this week, like, when I first went on staff at a church, I thought we actually, you know, did the stuff Jesus did. Then I realized it was a business more than it was ministry. And I remember they would say stuff like, man, that guy's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. Like, I bought into that for a minute, like, oh, yeah, he's too spiritual. Who, there's nobody too spiritual. There's people not enough spiritual. There's people too religious, but there's nobody too spiritual. And I bought into it. He's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. Paul is literally telling the scripture that we should be heavenly minded. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. See, that changes your worldview. I'm not looking at the world from a horizontal point of view. I'm looking at it from a vertical point of view. If I look at it from a horizontal point of view, every single storm that comes looks like that storm is forever. But we're looking from a heavenly point of view, you see that it's a temporary storm. When you go through trials, it seems like when you look at it horizontally, you're not going to make it through. But when you look at it vertically, you see the timeline of God. And so your perspective should change. And your mindset is where you choose to set your mind. Listen, your mindset is just simply where you choose to set your mind. You can set it on earthly things. Where you're dwelling on the what ifs of life, what if this happens, what if this election goes this way, what if this happens, what if the economy breaks, what if this happens. You can sit in earthly things, or you can set your mind on heavenly things. That's not meaning you're not going to have earthly thoughts. It just means you don't sit your brain and your mind on earthly things. Like I'm still going to see, I'm still going to experience, but I'm setting my, my mind on heavenly things. What that means is things that look like they're forever are not forever. Things that are full of anxiety, there's no anxiety in heaven. There's fear on earth, but there's no fear in heaven. There may be no joy in this situation, but there's joy in heaven. And you get to choose where you set your mind. The problem most believers is we choose to set our mind on earthly things. We choose to set our minds on social media. We choose to set our minds on politics. We choose to set our mind on finances. We choose to set our mind on things that are going to rot and fade away. Instead of setting our mind on earth, on heavenly things. Because I would say, if you're so earthly minded, you're no heavenly good. But if you're heavenly minded, do you realize every one of the apostles... We're heavenly minded. How did Stephen face stoning? He was looking to the heavens. How did Jesus endure the pain and suffering of the cross? He was looking to the heavens. 
How did the Apostle Paul go from stoning to beaten to shipwreck? He was looking to the heavens. Like when you have a heavenly mindset, you still go through earthly things. You just see it from a different perspective. And that's how I love God. Like I love God that even going through it, I'm looking at it from a different perspective. So the question to be, to wrap it all up, are you loving God with all your mind? Are you loving him with your thought life? Are you loving him with the way that you think? So Pastor, what's that do you mean? Like even just simply your, fi- are you, your finances, do you think about your finances the way God thinks about them or the way the world thinks about them? Your family, do you think about your, your family, your spouse, the way the world thinks about family and your spouse? Or do you think about your family and spouse the way God thinks about them? Are you loving God with a holy curiosity? There's a whole generation of young people that are extremely intelligent. Like so much smarter than most of us in this room. But they bought into a lie from education that you can't be intelligent and a follower of Jesus. And I would tell you, Isaiah 55 is your calling card. Learn all you can about what God has placed inside of you, the hunger for the human body, and be a healing instrument of God in the hospital. Teachers, learn all you can about psychology and kids so you can teach them better than anybody else in the world has ever taught them. If you're a chemist, learn all you can about chemistry and use it to glorify God through your discoveries and through how you work. If it's bio, whatever it is, let it be something that motivates you. To use your brain for the glory of God. You would bow your heads and close your eyes real quick. We're all going to leave here in just a second. When we leave here, we all leave here with an operating system. For some of your operating system, the pattern you're thinking, maybe more resembles the kingdom way. That you try to think through everything based on what God's word says what God thinks and what honors God. And then some of you, you'll come to church on Sunday, you try to change the, what you do and you're going to leave and you're going to go back in the same exact things you do over and over and over again. You be, maybe we wonder, well, why does that happen? It's because the operating system is bad. You can press control, alt, delete. You can swipe out some of those windows that are bogging down the system on Sunday morning. When you go back home, that operating system is going to reproduce the same thing it's been reproducing unless you change the operating system. And the way you change the operating system is you have to die to self and shut down the current computer. And then let Jesus reboot your life with a new life or now he's the programmer of your life. He's the one determining, we call it a discipleship. He's the one determining your way of thinking. He's the one programming your mind. He's the one programming your desires. He's the one programming your life. He's the one program. And now you have a different operating system to be able to function life with. So today, I'm not going to have everybody stand up. I'm not going to have everybody come forward. But in a second, I'm going to have you respond. So would I have to respond? No, you don't have to. But it's very clear in the Bible that every single person who the Holy Spirit was working on them responded to the inner working of the Holy Spirit by saying yes to Jesus publicly. It even says farther along that if you don't confess him before people, he won't confess you before the Father. So I'm not going to have you stand up and come forward. I, I believe that public moment will be baptism for you. But I do think there's something about marking a moment in time by responding to the work of the Holy Spirit. And so if that's you, maybe you've tried to control, alt, delete. You've tried to swipe out some of those windows. But it seems like after you get back in the rhythm, you go back in the same routine. That is the Holy Spirit pointing out to you that your operating system is corrupted. And he wants you to have a new operating system. And that starts today. It starts with saying yes to Jesus, dying to self, call that repentance. And then beginning to let him renew your thinking or renew your programming with his word. So that's you. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. So that's me, Pastor. I just want you to simply just raise your hand right where you are. So that's me, Pastor. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Put your hands down if you raise them. I'm just going to pray for you and just right here in a second. But I'm going to ask you to do me a huge favor if you raise your hand. Would you please just swing by connection point and just say, hey, I raised my hand with Pastor in that prayer. So we can put a gift in your hand. It's going to help you renew your way of thinking, but also introduce you 
to the programmer, and we want to walk with you from here all the way to eternity. We believe that salvation is the beginning, not the end of the journey. Father, we bless you in this place. And we thank you that your mercies are new every single morning. And that your grace is sufficient in our weakness. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for your inner working and your people in this room. And I pray right now for these that responded, that raised their hands. Father, I pray you begin a work in them. As they crucify their flesh, as they die to self, that you allow for there to be a resurrection in Jesus with new life, with new hope, with new dreams, with new way of thinking. I pray that as they read their word, it transforms their thinking, it renews their mind, and it changes their entire life. As Father, as you wash them in the blood of Jesus, as you cleanse them from all unrighteousness, I pray that you set their feet on the solid rock of Jesus Christ for them to live their lives in a way that gives you glory from here all the way to the throne room of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Ravi. It's so good to know that if you love the Lord,